So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this virtual presentation. My name is Ryan Connery with the Essex National Heritage Area. Uh, in partnership with the National Park Service, Essex Heritage presents Early Architecture in Essex County, a field institute in preserving the past. This in-depth multi-part series will give participants a detailed look at stories and challenges involved in stewarding some of the oldest surviving <laughs> structures located within the Essex National Heritage Area. We will be talking uh, tonight about um, first period houses in Ipswich, but this program series will um, include a series of virtual classrooms, walking tours, and presentations with historians and museum professionals to learn about the origins of 17th century European architecture in Essex County and how modern organizations are working to preserve these historic buildings. Uh, a few important notes before we begin. First, there are live captions available for those that would like uh, to utilize those. In the menu at the bottom of your screen, you'll want to select closed caption and then show subtitle to enable that. To turn off the captions, select hide subtitle. Following the presentation, there will be a Q&A with the speaker. Please submit all of your questions by typing them into the chat function at any point during the talk, and we'll try to get to as many as, uh, as we can. So you won't be able to unmute during the talk. And finally, this presentation will be recorded and made available on the Essex Heritage YouTube channel. Um, we'll provide a link to the recording to all attendees once that is uploaded. Um, and now for the program. So tonight's presentation is an introduction to first period architecture in Essex County with Gordon Harris. Mr. Harris has been the town historian for Ipswich since 2014 and is the current chair of the Ipswich Historical Commission, not to be confused with the Ipswich Historical Society, now the Ipswich Museum. Um, he's a native of Mississippi and has lived in Massachusetts since graduating from Millsaps College in 1971 and moved to Ipswich in 2004. Although he majored in sociology, he makes his living as a carpenter with a special interest in architectural history. In addition to leading walking and bicycle tours of Ipswich, he created and produces the Ipswich, uh, historic Ipswich website, which receives uh, 400,000 page views every year. Um, of the hundreds of houses that were constructed in Parter and Hole during the first century of English settlement in Massachusetts, 59 are in Ipswich. Tonight, Gordon will discuss features to search out to help you identify first period structures based on appearance, layout, and architectural <laughs> features that distinguish them from the succeeding Georgian era. Diagrams demonstrating first period construction techniques will be accompanied by exterior and interior photographs from several of the best preserved Ipswich first period houses. Uh, the earliest builders to settle Massachusetts Bay were trained in English post medieval techniques and adapted this form to the New England climate. <clears throat> Houses constructed after about 1720 are generally distinguishable by symmetry, proportion, and interior decoration. While most first period houses were enlarged or modified to present a more fashionable appearance, renovations in recent decades have exposed and restored earlier elements. So we hope that you enjoyed this presentation by Gordon Harris, and I will now turn it over to him. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Set my share screen here. Um, this is the uh, Payne House. It's it's on uh, Jeffrey's Neck Road. The house dates to about 1694. It's owned by the Trustees of Reservations. And uh, to set this up as my uh, as my screen for starting my slideshows about first period houses. Um, it's open occasionally. Trustees of reservations have usually had a fall uh, showing of the house. Um, most of the houses that we're going to be looking at here tonight, and there's a lot. Uh, I have actually uh, 95 slides that we could we could see tonight, but we go through them pretty quickly. Uh, almost all the houses in this, which that are early first period, are also lived in. That's something really unique. It's not a uh, it's not a reproduction town. It's it's a real first period town where people live in the houses. Many often that um, their their ancestors may have, may have even built. So this is a sort of a map of the uh, layout of of Ipswich. If you're familiar with the town, this is the Meeting House Green. Is where the settlers first came, and and um, this is this these red houses uh, are all in walking in walking um, distance from Meeting House Green. And there's a reason because. 
it was a Puritan law in Massachusetts Bay Colony that everyone had to have a, a townhouse within half a mile of a meeting house. All of these houses is an incomplete list here, um, owned and occupied by, by the people uh, people lived in those houses. Uh, most of what I um, what I know and and what I'm sharing with you tonight uh, comes from uh, Abbott Lowell Cummings. He was a, the genuine authority on first period construction. Uh, spent his life studying it. This book, these his books are out of print, but they're available on on Amazon. And I, if you're interested in first period construction, I highly suggest that you um, that you buy this book. Um, I keep suggesting that, and I notice the prices keep going up uh, on, on eBay. It's uh, the framed houses of uh, Massachusetts Bay. So the settlers of Ipswich uh, primarily came from uh, East Anglia. And on this map, um, you can see actually that uh, uh, a lot of people who lived, uh, settled in Ipswich came, came from Ipswich, England, uh, East Anglia. Uh, same way with Newbury and other towns. And they brought with them the post-medieval uh, construction techniques that, that they were familiar with, actually techniques that they had learned uh, and were now beginning to change in England, but changed here much later. Uh, this is believed to be the oldest uh, uh, house in New England, one of the oldest houses in, um, in America. It's the Fairbanks house in Dedham. We know it's 1641 because uh, dendrochronology has been has been conducted on the house. Um, Jonathan Fairbanks and his wife Grace uh, had a farm here. Um, the, the wood, the beams are are dates that far back. Uh, we know because with dendrochronology, you actually do tree ring counting, sophisticated form of tree ring counting. I'll talk about that um, a little bit later as we get into some of the switch houses. I often use that as a as a comparison with the houses that I've examined in this town um, to see what are the you know the comparative uh, uh, techniques. For example, this is a wind brace in the Fairbanks house. It's, this one is actually you're looking in in the attic, so it's an unusual place to see this kind of uh, wind brace. Uh, this particular house has uh, uh, purlins and and rafters that are that are a different a slightly different form than what you find mostly in in the Essex County area. Purpose of the wind brace, and you can see this one is sort of pulled apart a little bit, is, is that it gives you an angle. It's a diagonal uh, brace. Notice that the pegs, these are pegs. Uh, there were no nails when they built these houses and the houses were built with wooden pegs that are, we call, they call tree nails or trinnels for short. Take a look at this. This is a wind brace that I, I saw in um, the house that we call the Taverner Sparks house in Ipswich. This was in a side wall, but it served the same purpose. Now it's in the middle of the house in a, in a wall that separates the front from the back, um, the back section. But originally that, that back wall was the actual rear wall of the house. Many of the houses that we're gonna be looking at, looking at uh, have been expanded to the back. That's a good example there of the same kind of wind brace. And there's the, um, the tree, tree nails, the uh, trennels. When I saw that, I began thinking, well, this is this is a pretty old house. It's using that same technique. I know I've seen that picture somewhere. Um, and I was recently uh, fortunate to, um, to get to go in this house and, and the owners um, asked me to do you know, a study of the house, look at the architecture elements. And we determined that the left side is older. Uh, it may have been only a single floor house at the beginning. Uh, as is true with so many Ipswich houses, this one was expanded to the right. This is an 18th, um, 18th century expansion. Uh, John and Mary Sparks, uh, they ran a tavern, a famous tavern in Ipswich, and there were a succession of taverns uh, across from the meeting house. Um, I think maybe when people, after sitting for hours listening to the Puritan minister drone on, they, they needed a good drink, and rum was their drink of choice here. But another thing is that in these taverns, this is where they held court for probably the first hundred years before an actual courthouse is built in Ipswich. The courts were, were quarterly and they would meet first in Essex, I mean, in Salem, and then they would meet in, in Ipswich. So Boston and Salem and Ipswich at first were the three Shire towns. Interestingly, the last witchcraft trial after the Salem trials 
one in which the, the you know, this four people were, were hung. The last one was tried in Ipswich. They took it out of Salem, 200 outstanding cases. And we know that it would have been tried uh, in the tavern. And this is the tavern that was there at that time because there was no courthouse. It was uh, quite a high form of entertainment to come and watch the trials. We feel good that those all 200 of those people that were accused were all set free that day. This is a summer beam is the is the main carrying beam across a ceiling um, supports the floor joist. As in most of the Essex County houses, this one is longitudinal. This is a sidewall here. You see little chamfers. This um this can be a little confusing for us. We don't know uh, for sure if the chamfers mean that 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 it comes early or it comes late. But during during the middle of the first period. Uh, chamfers got more and more, um, uh, more ornate to the point that they were they became a, a form of art. We'll take a look at some of those. You can see the summer the uh, post here and supporting the uh, front beam and, and the side beam, the girt, whichever you may call that. I just wanted to bring show you this house uh, for comparison. This is one of my favorite houses in Ipswich. It's, it's um, uh, the front of the house is is the um, John Wainwright house, and it was built about 1726. It's a very fine early Georgian house. So you see the symmetry that um, I think Colin was talking about there and two chimneys instead of those one central chimney. But the it's called the Wainwright Treadwell house because even though the inside of the house and the front, that part is very fine. You see all the, all the, the, the kind of moldings that you would expect uh, in a Georgian house. In the back of the house, is is a wing of the house, which might have been the original uh, Daniel Treadwell house. So this this um, this uh, fireplace with the with the ovens in the back. Uh, first of all, the bake oven that was the way bake ovens were were constructed, you know, in the early years. But by about the turn of the 18th century, they began to put the bake ovens, as you're probably more familiar with, uh, on the side. In either case, they had to put the ashes in and heat the bake oven up. Uh, that points to it being an early, uh, an early oven and uh, fireplace, and it's also almost identical to the to the uh, Isley House, uh, which is about 1680, um, in in Newbury or Newburyport. Now I went down in the basement of, of, of that house when I examined it, and I saw um, I saw these um, re this reused beams. First of all, it, there's a little chamfer here, so probably it's a beam. It came from the um, from the Treadwell house in the back when they when they took took part of it down. Um, and because especially because it's sitting on a brick pillar there. This is what caught my eye. If you can see what I'm circling here, this is called the haunch tusk tenon. And um, uh, Cummings wrote about these. He's seen them in only one house, uh, at least that he mentions in the book. And that's the Fairbanks house. So we're going back, you know, to, to a house that was built in was it 16, uh, 1640s? And it's a very complicated way of, of inserting the joist uh, with this bevel into, into, the, um, into the summer beam. I should mention that the summer beam is a, is a word that we don't really know the, quite the origin, but it, it's been thought that perhaps it refers to Italian roots of the word summer, which means strength. It's certainly the, beam, the largest beam in the house. This is this shows how those joists were inserted in. It was very, it wasn't very long, you know, well, well before the end of the 17th century that they were basically just making a square uh, a hole there to insert the, jo the joist in. This is a lot of work for a really early house. But here I see this in the, in the, um, uh, the Wainwright Treadwell house. And that says to me that, that the rear end of the house that has that, that fireplace is really old. And we have a house in Ipswich that looks really old. This is what you might call a planter's cottage. This is a reproduction. Um, this is right next to the Whipple house down to South Green. It was built about, uh, or I guess about 12 years ago um, by a group of volunteers. Alexander Knight came to Ipswich and uh, like most people, he had enough resources that he wasn't kicked out of town because people of this, which didn't want to have to support the poor people that might show up and not have any money. But what happened to him was not was sad. His house burned down. His son was, um, infant son was killed in the fire. 
uh, he, he was shunned. People accused him of, of killing his own child and he became destitute and the town built him a little house uh, for him and his, his wife and their re remaining children. And the plans were in the town hall records, uh, the town clerk's office. Um, they, they found those plans and they reproduced that house. This is a, shows it's just a simple house with the kinds of posts, um, you know, the plates, the, the braces, and, and, and um, uh, it has a thatched roof. The, interestingly, those really early chimneys were made out of wood. They didn't have any um, real masonry. They, just a pile of, of stone would not have been sufficient. Uh, the, the real problem was lack of lime once they could, they could begin to fill the joints. Um, they discovered that without lime, they could, they could use clay. And there's a lot of houses that still have clay uh, mortar in between the bricks or the stones. Very soon, most of the, the wood chimneys, well, they were lined with clay on the inside, daubed with clay, and that supposedly would prevent them from burning, but you can imagine a wood chimney with a thatched roof is not, that house is not gonna last a long time. And thus, they were banned, well, you know, within just a few decades. I wanna show you this house. This is one I, I took a look at on Mental Street. This is actually the barn behind the house. I believe the house was moved and it was early, uh, early 1700s, but the barn, we're not sure uh, if it was moved or constructed on, on site. What caught my eye was we have, we have the, um, uh, you know, to a typical uh, post. This is sort of like a gun stock post. It gets a little bit wider, it's diagonal braces. You can see they took out a partition here at one point, um, but then this is a joint in the, in this, in the corner when they, this house was being rebuilt, uh, this, this barn this very complicated joint. Think about all the things that's got to happen at the roof line. This post is coming up. It's got to catch a joist, a, a, a beam across the front. It's also got to catch uh, this beam that's going, going back. And then there's a rafter coming up and all of those complicated joints all are uh, mortise intended by hand. Uh, they didn't have power tools and then connected with, with, with dowels or tree nails is the column. And the nice thing about that is you can still disassemble those house like, like uh, Tinker Toys or whatever, take them apart and move them uh, in that same fashion. So when I looked at that joint, I thought, okay, let's look at the Fairbanks house again. This is back to 1641 Fairbanks house. Uh, this is a really nice dovetail trench in that corner. Um, of course, these are, these are architectural drawings of, of really old pieces of wood. But the, the, the joints are very similar. Uh, everything was Morris and Tenon. Now, mind you, these these pieces of wood are really, really heavy. Uh, you don't just put the put the post up and start carving away. You know, everything was done on on the ground. Uh, everything was laid out. It was scribed. Marks were put to say, okay, this goes this goes here, this goes there. And then, uh, then you know, probably the whole village would come out and help erect all of this these heavy timbers. There's um, this is how they did that. This this is actually the boardman from the picture from the boardman house uh, in Saugus. It's, it's a photograph from from the attic. Notice that each one of the um, <clears throat> of the rafters and the braces going across <clears throat> are marked to show which one goes where. They did the same thing with um, you know uh, almost every element in the house. So this house here, <clears throat> this is the Hart House. Six, it's called the 1640 Hart House. It's on Linebrook Road in Ipswich, and it's it's a restaurant. It's got great food. When you go inside this restaurant, uh, you can go inside some really really old rooms. And this, you know, it has wings on it that were built uh, to be compatible with with the um, with the style of the older house. The oldest part of this house uh, was right here, room one room over another room. This is the picture of the same house going back, you know, back into the 19th century. There's those two original rooms. So they, they, they actually date back to about 16, 1670s because dendrochronology has been done on this house as well. Tree ring counting. This side over here is, is not, not new. It's, it, you know, it's a Georgian addition that was put on the house. Interestingly enough, it's built into a bank. So this room, the lower room, is uh, you have to step down into that room. That's how the house originally was when they expanded. They changed some elevations. 
So what happened was um, a, uh, an antiques dealer named Burnham owned the house, the hard house in the um, early 1900s. And he arranged for those uh, two original rooms of the hard house to be moved. Oh, the, the lower room, which is called the keeper's room was moved uh, to the Metropolitan Museum. The, up, the upstairs uh, room, it was moved to the Winterthur Museum. So uh, they're there, they're actually there in those museums now. And what the, uh, the museums did is they had collected artifacts, timbers from first period houses and had already built a replica, but they wanted the real thing. And Burnham was happy to sell them, to sell them the house. So they reproduced uh, those two rooms uh, with the original first period elements. You can see the chamfer. This is a really, it was a really pretty, pretty uh, nice house with, for the time with, with with the um, rounded, the, the beaded chamfer there, the joists going across uh, Mordistan, and the, the uh, rounded fireplaces. I find I find those in a number of houses, usually house, houses that were built for for the uh, town's leaders or the ministers. So I'm going to tell you, uh, show you what I'm talking about when I say dendral chronology. Uh, you find the the largest beam in the house. You really like if you're really lucky, you'll find a little bit of bark on the side of that beam, and you, and this is a, a drill which is hollow on the inside. They drill into straight into the center, hopefully to get to the very heart of the tree, um, and then pull out these cores. So these are samples of the kind of cores that um, that are pulled out. And you can see taking a look at this one, or say taking a look at this. Here's the uh, center of the tree. They were they they managed to get right at it. And that, that's really necessary to get enough cores. And then as you go along with the growth range, you notice some of them are smaller, and then you've got a, a large one, and it really varies. As you get further out, uh, the tree is probably not growing as fast, and the growth rings are, are smaller. So they're doing more than just counting the rings, usually, because you're, it's not that often that you get every, every grain, every ring from the center of the tree to the, to the outside bark. But what they can do is, is lay down the piece that they get by a known piece of, of wood of the same species from the same area it has gone through the same climatic uh, experiences. And even though the outside, the bark might be missing on the piece that you just sampled, they lay it next to one that they do know and they, they age off. And that's how they, they determine the ages. We found that most that, uh, the houses in this which that were supposedly built in the 1630s and 1640s. We haven't found any of them that were built before the 1670s. Yeah. I just had this one picture of, of, a, of a, a gravestone from the old North burial ground um, because people ask me, you know, they, they come for genealogy tours. They want to see, for example, they want to see where Thomas Hart lived and they want to see where the streets he walked on. And they also want to see the graves and here we are at the Old Lipswich Cemetery, which dates back to only the year after it was founded, 1634. Here's the gravestone of Thomas Hart Sr. right there, not far from, from where his house was. This house, this is a diagram, it's a pretty old diagram of, of the Balch House in Beverly. And uh, it started out as just this little house here. Uh, and this is that little house. Uh, a wing was added onto the side. And then over the years in the Georgian era, which was all about balanced facades, they brought a room, an extra floor up and built, and the house began to take the form that we're accustomed to seeing as, you know, uh, usually five, five windows over four windows with a door. Uh, typical colonial, colonial house and was very popular during the Georgian era to do that. And then there was actually another addition, a sort of a salt box addition that was added even later. And this is a diagram that shows you the number of different levels. The original roof is, was still hidden inside or parts of it in that house. I found the same things uh, in Ipswich often when we're trying to determine uh, how old the house is. And when we put a date on a house, um, like for example, this house, 1723, it's the Benjamin Grant house. It's on uh, it's on County Street. If you take a look at the roof line, um, right about here where the chimney is, uh, the roof takes a big change. A big change here. This perspective, you you can't quite see. It's, this was actually, I think, maybe from a, a Google Street View when I when I when I was getting this photo. 
Um, but this side of the house um, was added on. Usually uh, you build a, a half a house with a young, a young man might have, um, you know, he's 20 years old, he builds his house, builds half of a house. Later on, he expands his house to look like this. This is another example of the same thing. And in this case, it's really easy to see that this house was built in two different uh, parts. Uh, Summer Street is the oldest street in Ipswich. It's the oldest adopted way. Originally, it was just called the way to the river. Of course, if you were at the river, it was called the way to the meeting house. And um, uh, the Foster family uh, lived uh, at the lower end of, of Summer Street and built a number of houses. So this house originally, again, ha originally had a chimney here. Uh, this would have been the edge of the house, a half a house. And then when they added on this wing, apparently with not such a great foundation, um, uh, they took away that chimney and they and it actually has another chimney behind the dormer, uh, much more late, late Georgian uh, uh, with all those modifications. This one uh, on further up East Street, it's called the Baker House. This is an example of what I'm talking about with a half house. Uh, it never was expanded. Um, a lot of the a lot of the houses, the older houses in Ipswich, will have these are called cottage windows, six over nine, or if it's nine over six, that's called reverse cottage. And take a look at this. Uh, so many houses in, in Essex County, this, you know, the really old houses, will have this little narrow uh, uh, wing on the back. It's called Beverly Jog. You know, what was happening, it's not unlike today that, you know, the kids grow up, they can't afford to buy a house. They're still living with the, with their parents and the parents are saying, you know what, you guys, I'm tired of you trumping in my front door and getting everything messed up. I'm building a set a stairway on the side of the house. And, and somehow those came to be called a Beverly Jog. People use them today usually as they, uh, uh, as they have closets or bathrooms in there. Now, you look at this house, it's, it's just a couple of doors up uh, from that house is the Matthew Perkins house. And oftentimes we think of when we see houses like this with the overhangs, uh, front overhang, and even this is called a facade gable at the top, we tend to think, oh, those must be really old houses. What's interesting is, yes, that's, uh, that was the post-medieval style in, uh, in England when they began building larger houses, sometimes the cartways were so narrow that you just, they said, you just can't build your house further out into the street. And they would, they would extend their house, build a second floor, and extend it out over the first floor. So they were almost shadowing over the street. This is actually, this is a, it's called, what's called a hewn um, overhang. It's not really a framed one. When they're framed, they go out probably a couple of feet, sometimes in England even further. What was going on here was all those early houses that were built with those, those framed overhangs, um, they disappeared. But it became a, a fashion, and, and from around 1680 to 1710, to, it was the post-medieval revival fashion. Just before the Georgian fashion came along, Georgian fashion won out. Uh, the Matthew Perkins House was bought by Spinea, the Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, which is called, now called Historic England, has a preservation agreement on it. This is just a side profile of the same house, just to show you how steep those roofs are. And this one also has a salt box on it and, and uh, confess that I'm not sure if the salt box is original. Uh, uh, I think it was. And usually when, when you have um, an added on salt box, it'll be at a different angle so they can get a little more elevation. But, um, Matthew Perkins, when he built this house in, in 1701, um, he, he was building it as an inn. And I think he was saying, you know, people might want to come to Ye Olde uh, Perkins Inn in an old medi post-medieval house here. And I think he did that on purpose. This is just a diagram of how a house like that is built. Uh, the, uh, the, the posts go up to, the, the first floor posts go up underneath the, uh, the side beams or girts. And then that extends over. And, and then the posts for the second floor are basically suspended in the air uh, mortised into that beam. And th that overhang continues all the way across. Uh, a lot of these houses, not necessarily all of them, but many of them are built with planks, uh, plank construction in the front. It means that they had vertical boards rather than the usual horizontal boards. And the planks are, are a couple of inches thick. 
this is the diagram of just how they did that. Again, take a look at that at that uh, joinery. That's very much like that barn I was showing you, and and um, uh, and the house in Dedham. Uh, so this joint catches a lot of this woodwork. This is the front beam that that's going up for the first floor. This the, the beam, the overhanging girt uh, or beam, uh, as interchangeable words for that one, uh, hangs over, and it's tenoned into into what's the post for the second floor and creates that overhang that we see. There's another house that was built in the same way. And this is Thomas Knowlton. Uh, we know the house was built about 1688 and uh, it's really in good shape. The, the house uh, you look at from the outside, it's like the Whipple house, it's like the um, Matthew Perkins house. Inside it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very modern house uh, with all the, with original woodwork exposed. Um, and I think that's the way it has to be done. Not many people want to live in a, in a house with no electricity or, or no plumbing, you know, uh, no paint because of the first period houses, the, all the woodwork was, ex, was uh, exposed. They were very dark. Um, so there are compromises that have to be made just to keep these houses around. This is um, what we call the three sisters. So this is sort of a different kind of a first period house. Uh, hall and parlor houses, you see all of these have been basically Georgianized. Uh, and there is some question as to um, what these houses originally looked like and how old they really are. These two houses on the left both claim to be built right around 1660. The one on the right is, is, is a, uh, 1700s. They're all very similar. We call them parlor, parlor, hall and parlor houses, and the, and the layout is almost identical, is identical in, all, in all of these houses. On a half house, the wall would just stop. The hall is the, is the main room. This is where when you visit, when you visited, you would be invited into the hall, a large fireplace. It would be the cooking fireplace. You can see I put the summer beam, um, the shadow of that going across. These are what are called longitudinal summer beams. They, they went right into the masonry or into a girt here, into a smaller girt right over the window. The room on the right-hand side, that's the parlor. That would be more like, you know, maybe, maybe the, 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 the parents might sleep there. The children would probably be pushed upstairs. One of the interesting things about these houses is that they all had the same small entrance with the winding stairs. I'll show you a couple of pictures of those. Um, so here's the construction of a hall and parlor house. You notice the, um, uh, this is a single floor one, so it's really a cape. Um, and that is called a gunstock post where they flare out and catch uh, the woodwork um, that's necessary to tie all of this together. Uh, the uh, large rafters would carry what's called a purlin. And then in some cases, you would have a smaller uh, common rafters, um, meaning they, um, they might carry a principal, principal rafters and common rafters, and then, and then you've, got, you've got this common purlin or principal purlin, depending on what, which they're carrying. They're showing you both, both forms here um, of purlins. And the, most of the houses in, in our area that date back even in, well into the, into the 1700s, even sometimes the 1800s, have these, these um, large principal rafters and the common purlins. Common meaning that they carry all the vertical boards coming down. Um, not mean, it does not mean that there's something common about, about the wood itself. So this is one of those houses. This, uh, this one that we have a date here, 1669 for the left side of the house, which is apparently older, 1693 for, for the right side of the house. Again, a, Beverly, a large, generous Beverly jog on, that, on the left side. This is inside the Wilkham house. Uh, I think this house has been greatly restored. Uh, this appears to me, the, uh, the, the beam carrying uh, the weight over the fireplace appears to be a replacement. You can see the bevel on the, on, the, on the side of the summer beam. And that's part of what lends the question. We have these for the, for the property that goes back uh, to this date. It was 1656 or so. Um, but, um, we also want to look at our architectural features and see if we can what we find in common with houses that we know. So what we do know is that the really earliest houses had this chamfer, and that later on the chamfer would would 
in the 17, early 1700s got smaller and often was beaded, but um, they but they also went back to having just a, cham a common chamfer uh, before they eliminated them all together. This is the house that's next door to it. It's called the Thomas Lord House. And I think he, uh, Colin mentioned that I'm a carpenter. I've done a lot of work in this house. Um, so I've seen a lot of the woodwork and it appears to me that this house was built all in one piece. Uh, the windows, I, re I replaced the window sashes uh, and we were able to actually still use these same window frames or something like 150 years old. These are a uh, wood replacement or uh, sashes that again, that, that's, uh, that's a cottage style with, with a 609. Inside the house, this is what leads us to think the house might be as old as the deeds suggest. It's a very wide chamfer um, going in, going into this, you know, the beam on the on the on, over the window. These wide chamfers uh, generally were where they got narrower and narrower as they became more refined. Up the street from that house, which we're continuing up High Street, which has the greatest collection of first period houses in America. This is the Edward Brown house and they invited me in last winter. The uh, right side is the older side. The left side is, is significantly later at sometime in the 1700s. Uh, in the back of the house, there's a salt box. So when I, when I went up into the attic, um, I saw something I've seen in two or three other houses in town. This is the original rear rafters. And you can see where the purlins that went across just like these. Carried, carried the weight of, of, the, um, of the roof boards. They took the roofing off and they added a new roof in the back to create a salt box. And these are, these are the purlins um, that then were put in. Uh, and there was no reason in the attic to take this away. There's other evidences in this house of how, just how old this house is. You're looking at the chimney from the attic and what you see first here, is, this is the uh, the old the original chimney right here. The bricks are substantially taller and fatter, and that's the way they were making them in the in you know up to maybe 16, 1680 or so, making them by hand uh, individually, slow process. And they found that the bricks, um, first of all, a, a fat brick uh, does not dry as uniformly as a as a narrower brick. The colony tried to um, you know legally enforce uh, uh, uniform sizes, but it took a while before that happened. So when the, what's actually we're looking at from the back, so the left side of the house was added, this is that chimney was added right next to it. You see that the bricks are, are already getting smaller. And then this is the chimney that was added on for the salt box uh, in the back. And it's all that's one huge piece of masonry sitting on a, a massive stone foundation. Take a look though at at the uh, the mortar, even I'm thinking the salt box is built. Uh, and the, the salt box addition, or lean to as they call it, uh, sometime in the 1700s, and they were still using clay for a mortar. Uh, this is all clay. When you put your fingers on it, you can rub it, and a little bit of it will come off. Uh, um, eventually, I think in the early 1700s, they did have lime mortar. Um, this continued to be in use because it was common. It's easy to get clay. Only on the outside, when you got to the over the roof line, you can't use clay outside. It, it you know, it doesn't harden permanently like, like uh, lime mortar does. And the second floor in that in that house, I'm showing you this picture just to show you that the bedroom was was Georgianized. This is actually planks that have been beaded, this little cork bead. And I had we did not open we haven't opened it up to see if it was. Um, it, you know, if it was built the same way as downstairs. Um, but it was not uncommon that they might, that one room might be Georgianized and another might, the other rooms might not be. But it was also a practice in the early 1900s when there was really a lot of interest in, in old houses and bringing them back, that they might have taken off the boards that were added downstairs to show just how old the house was. This is a friend of mine, um, Paul McGinley's house uh, he sold just a couple of years ago. Uh, he lived in it for, I think, 50 years and restored a lot of it, showing you this just for the, um, the gunstock post. We call it the gunstock corner post because it uh, gets wider at the top than it is at the bottom, so it's like a, a rifle handle. And you can pick, see again just 
all the joinery that was necessary. And, you know, these, these guys that came to Ipswich and all of Essex County, especially in the Essex Is area, we're talking about upper middle class people of England. A lot of them were here not only because they were Puritans and, and there were problems with, you know, with the crown. And the crown was only too happy to make a charter with them uh, and uh, for them to leave. And uh, they both thought they were getting a good deal. Of course, poor King Charles I lost his head. In the meantime, the colony was left alone here, and the people who had money uh, came and built these fine houses, probably had indentured servants breaking on them. Uh, and you think, think about the Winthrops and the Appletons and other families that came early with, with gifted, say, 200, 400, 600 acres of land, and those families continued to be rich right on up to our own day. This is uh, the next first period house down the street. It's called the Caldwell House. Cummings took a look at this and he said he didn't believe it was built before 1700. They have a date on the sign, um, uh, 1660. This is the inside of the house. Uh, the beam, summer beam, not, uh, not well chamfered. Again, suggesting either that it's really early or that it's probably right around 1720 when they're beginning to start, start to box these, these, these beams in. That was during the Georgian era. Um, this is again a rounded fireplace in, in this house, so it shows it was a fine house. And this little, you'll see this in almost every fireplace. It's, it's a smoke throat. Um, they discovered early that if they made this little throat in there, that, that the smoke would go up um, and, and that, you, that it would not be pouring back into the room. This is a close up of what we're just looking at. This is the summer beam. Um, the chamfer that they always put on them. And then there was always a little finish um, that had to be done because you got a square joint. You're not going to want to run an angled summer beam into a square joint. So it was finished out um, with a little chamfer uh, to, to end there. And, and a lot of times it's hard to tell the detail on this one. But they, look, they look like a lamb's tongue and they're often referred to it as lamb's tongue stops. This is the front entry in the Caldwell house. I think I was um, telling you about that front literal entryway. I'd say maybe seven feet wide and only three or four feet deep. And then you've got the winding stairs. You'll see this in almost every uh, uh, first period house that's been well preserved. Uh, and this is a door that would take you down under stairs down into the basement. You notice on the side here, um, this is from the HAB survey. It was, this was done during the CCC um, WPA days that they hired photographers to, to do an inventory of all the historic houses all throughout America. It's called HAB's Historic American Building Survey. And these wonderful black and white photos are on the National Park Service site. This, I included this, this photograph for two reasons. One is these the stairs apparently have never been replaced going up into the attic. And when you see stairs that don't look like this, it doesn't necessarily mean the house isn't old. It just means that they've had to replace the, thread, the steps um, because they just wear out. And certainly that one up there wore out quite a bit. There's also something very unusual with it, with a fireplace that should, suggests to me, it may just be this half of it was repointed and half was not, but to me, it looks like the fireplace might've been, the, the chimney rather might've been built in two different stages. Uh, just beyond it is the Daniel Loomis house. We thought it was about a 1720 house when um, my friend Al and his wife Kathy bought the house a number of years ago. And then they discovered when they peeled back a wall that had a little gas, gas uh, burner for heat, they opened it up and here was this wonderful fireplace behind. They also found other evidence uh, that indicated that the house was built in you know, the 1680s or so. And you see the smoke throat again in here. And this is called an ingle nook. And uh, it's something that was um, fairly popular in, in, found in England uh, when you had a huge fireplace like this one that's like eight or 10 feet wide uh, that you could sit inside that little nook and warm your feet and stay warm. And you can imagine how cold these, these drafty houses must have been back then, especially at the tail end of the little ice age. Um, and uh, burning 20 cords of wood every year just to stay warm. Next house down the street, uh, actually going up High Street on the right-hand side. This is the uh, John Loomis house. It was built in 1712. 
Now, uh, Phil Ross was restoring the house in, in 1960, so it didn't look quite this bad. It was bad, but uh, it, had, it had certainly uh, would seem better days, but he was already pulling off a, a rotted siding, and he was looking to see how his house was originally constructed because what he discovered was this. This is, what, this is how he rebuilt the house. He found what he believed were the original small window uh, openings. Um, uh, you can see, see that they've been closed up and the house had been Georgianized. He actually restored the chimney, which had been taken out. And it's a really nice house. It seems to me it needs a little more light. Um, right across from, if you know where Dunkin' Donuts is, up at Lord Square, the old burial ground is the John Kimball house. Uh, and that same antiques dealer, dealer named Burnham uh, owned this house and called it a ye old uh, oak, a house of oak. Uh, it was on the HAB survey, and, and HABs uh, actually did elevations, so you can see um, that it's not symmetrical, and most likely that the house was built in two different halves. Uh, and then when you look at the back, see the, see the line of the shed or salt box? It's not quite a straight line. So um, um, after about, you know, into, as we get into the 1700s, they were the salt box was so popular because it gave you a kitchen in the back of the house uh, that they began just building them that way. They were, that's called an integral salt box. In this case, you can tell that it was added on uh, and suggests that, that it could be uh, an early house like we believe it is. This is a photo from that HAB survey. Um, the, uh, the, the, the summer beam is is um, actually in this house. In this photo, is is going across, and that that is a that is a transverse summer beam. Uh, the joists go into a girt over the fireplace, um, and the, the house. I think Burnham had actually restored that house back to its original appearance. At least as he imagined it. This is a stairway in that same house. They'd stripped the paint down, tried to get it back. Notice it's very much, very much uh, like the Caldwell house that I just showed you. Almost all the first period houses look just like this when you walk in the front door. This is interesting, this houses grew in Ipswich. Uh, sometimes I think uh, rather than, you know, um, uh, kids moving away, they just kept, they added on. There was, I was leading a tour this morning showing a house that had been tripled in size and the one across the street is the same way. This one, the Kingsbury Lord house, uh, the left side claims to be 1660. I'm looking at a balanced facade. I don't believe it's 1660, neither did, neither did Cummings. Obviously, it has a, a nice federal uh, fan light there. So the, all of these, these decorative features added. This was added even later, and, and it was, I, I'm told that it was used as a school at one time. Here's another house that grew in the same way. This is a Shatswell house. In this particular house, we're, st we're seeing what we think is a really early house. Now, the owner has asked me to do some research on it, and I, I could see that it was built before 1690. What I couldn't agree with them was they want to believe it was built in the 1630s. And look at this, which was, this which was, was founded in 16, uh, settled in 1633 and incorporated in 1634. Uh, they were in the wilderness. Uh, there was still a Native American village here that was mostly depleted by disease, but they didn't come with where, the, the means or the tools to build houses like, like this side of the house um, in, in the 1630s. Uh, but what we, I have been in the attic of this house. It was expanded. Again, they added a salt box. They did it a different way than what I showed you with the, um, with the other house. They added these pieces on, and and uh, you can see that they lapped the joints to, to make to make the, the rafters longer. This is the original ridge post. Now now the rafter goes way over here, and uh, what that managed to do. Sorry, I thought I had a photo of the back of that house. It man managed to make that into a, a salt box. This was another interesting uh, opportunity that I had recently. This house has a funny history. Uh, you may have seen it. Uh, uh, it's uh, on High Street um, bet between the bridge and Lord Square. And uh, the owners of this, the Lord family had owned this quite a long time. 
um, Mr. Kilgore, who married Miss, uh, Mrs. Lord, uh, it was called the Kilgore House for uh, in mo more recently. But the Lord family tradition was that this had been the old jail and that it had been moved uh, and uh, this and, and reconstructed. Now, the old jail was on Meeting House Green by close to where the church is. Certainly, they did move a lot of houses, um, but the timelines don't work out right for, for this house having been that, that particular building. Another interesting thing about this house is that you have horizontal sheeting in the front and you have vertical size uh, sheeting, you know, like I showed you with the, uh, the overhang houses, only planks, plank sheeting only on one side, but there's evidence, it's hard to tell right here, there's a, actually a power line going across, but there is a little evidence here of something having been a, uh, a wing been on the side of the house at one time, that's actually a cutout where they filled it filled in from. Um, this building was added on to something that was here even earlier. Uh, I believe that the that the right side of the house is first period, and the left side um, was. We certainly know that that's the one that was added on later on. This is taking a look at that. So here's that stairway again, the first period stairway. That's the right side over there. Um, these are the summer beams on the left side, and then this this was uh, possibly even added later. This house grew a lot. There is a shed in the backs, a large salt box, and the second floor was added on top of that. Then you, they added on a, uh, a Beverly jog. But this is the original back wall of the house. Now it's in the middle of the house. Um, they took out some of the masonry in this job here, but you notice that the that the um, rafters. Uh, white. They, they were uh, whitewashed. It was very common uh, in these early houses, especially because it got so smoky that they would whitewash the, the, the floor joists and the, and the rafters to give some light into the house. So the very fact that that, that was whitewashed, even here, but these joists might be replacements, um, suggests that this house, uh, maybe all of this house uh, predates when they were installing plaster and ceilings. That would be the Georgian era. The, the people who owned this house believed for a long time that they had the oldest house in Ipswich. They wanted, they believed that that part of their house, um, and it certainly is old, um, dated back to the 1640s, but dendrochronology was done on it, and the oldest beam they could find uh, was 1670s called William Merchant House. This is a fireplace inside the William Merchant House in um, all the same kind of girts and summer beams that we we're accustomed to seeing, the smoke throat inside. Um, the ceilings are much lower in the house, and the, uh, the present owners have actually uh, stripped out a lot of the Georgianization or other, other um, later uh, walls that were put in so they, so they could actually uh, see, you can actually see the um, frame of the house. This is an example here. They actually stripped this wall back. This is the end. This is a summer beam, not a very good photo, but the summer beam goes right over the window. And this is just like in the Whipple house where it's supported by uh, a girt. It's kind of unusual to me that it had a little block in there. I don't know how that happened. But notice also that there's, these are old bricks or, or, or some kind of a mortar and the walls are often filled with that. Um, you know, sometimes they said, well, they, people believe that maybe they filled the, the walls with bricks to, to prevent Indian attacks. We hear that about the overhangs as well. And there's usually a functional reason as one is it gave rigidity to the, to the frame. And another is that it was a, for, a one way to add some insulate, insulation to the wall. Um, this house is no longer on South Main Street. It was called Ross Tavern. Uh, part of the house, probably this part here um, was on Market Street. Yeah, way back in the 1700s or, or, or maybe 1800s, it was moved south of the bridge, south of the Choke Bridge, <clears throat> which, by the way, is the oldest double stone arch bridge in America. <clears throat> um, you can see the overhangs on this house. Uh, there's there's a suspicion that maybe that overhang predates that post-colonial revival period. Um, it was in really bad condition. You can tell this had been a big, a big hotel tavern. It seemed much better days. Um, it was, it was uh, taken down and it was moved to the Wendell Estate on Strawberry Hill. 
and what they determine the way it might originally look is a little bit shocking. This is what the um, this is what the renovators uh, determined that the house might have looked like originally. I'm just going to take you back. Uh, and of course, there's wings upon wings upon wings, so it's hard to know exactly what they were they were thinking. Um, this is what they, in their imagination at least, um, thought. Um, we see that in a number of places in, in Salem, the house was built like that. But I think uh, the, the most outstanding example is what, what was done to this house. This is a Saugus Ironworks house in 1915. And that, um, I've, uh, that complex there, the ironworks and the house, um, were uh, greatly uh, restored or um, we'll call it restark uh, preservation or restoration. Um, this has that nice, really, really early chimney that might have given them a sign. So you look at this house, it's uh, kind of an unusual layout with the, with the windows, probably a double house. But they determined that this, that by looking inside, they saw exactly what we saw with the Balch house with all those different changes. This is what they came up with. Um, that's what the Ironworks house after what Wallace Nutting restored it in 1917. It's hard for me to, um, to look at that and look at the other house and say it's the same house, uh, but that's what they did. This is one of the really nicest uh, first period houses in, in this, which it's, if you're familiar with this, which it's on Turkey Shore, it's called the William Howard House. It's um, the Green Street Bridge close to the Ipswich River and the town hall uh, runs, would go straight, uh, straight towards the house. And um, it has that post medieval overhang. It's, it was built about 1680s, part of that, um, what I'd like to call is a architectural fashion of the day. Um, I've been in the house recently. The left side is, is older. Um, it was owned by Spinia, now historic New England, and, and uh, sold to the present owners a number of years ago uh, with the preservation agreement. The right side uh, it was added on a few decades later and during the Georgian era. So quite a difference in the two sides. This is, a, this is a, the summer beam going into the girt over over the chimney, and I was when I saw that uh, it sits in front of the in front in front of the chimney, I should say, in front of the fireplace. Not the 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 summer beams not embedded into the masonry like I see in so many other houses. I thought I said I've just seen that recently in another house, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes, um, and that gave me a hint as to maybe the date of of the, um, of the house. It's an, you know. You've got a deeper, this girt, the chimney girt is deeper, but doesn't have to be as um, taller, but doesn't have to be as, as, as wide or deep at the bottom. And that gives you a lot of strength. This is the other side of the house. This house also was in the HAB survey. And this is the Georgian side. So on that side of the house, all of the beams were um, boxed in. And there's a little, little beating, little beating that was done, uh, 1707. So a lot of changes had happened just in that, say 30 year period of uh, transitioning uh, from, uh, from first period to Georgian. And this would be a really early Georgian ceiling because uh, we usually think of first period as going to about 17 moon. The house I was thinking about is this house. It's at 30 East Street. Um, it's gone through a lot of changes. Uh, take a look on the left, on the far left of the photo, you can see that the original uh, the, the salt box, which had been added onto it, had been torn off at that time. Um, it's a it's a typical five bay. Five bay means uh, basically windows, five windows. On the side, you pretty much got it, uh, the single bay, which is also uh, sometimes called an I frame uh, or single pile. Um, and then it was bought by a, a guy named uh, Holly Buckland. And he did this. Uh, he decided that this house too, it had different kinds of windows. But what he installed was uh, uh, actually fenders and casements with um, faux, faux uh, you know, diagonal um, uh, mullions in the windows. And he added on this uh, front, uh, which is sort of a uh, we call that a, a English cross 
across gable house uh, when you have a especially when you have a gable in the back it's similar it's a cross gable this was not there was no foundation to indicate this was over there but he believed it should have it should have been there and that's what he did the house uh, is now for sale um there's been some tragedies in the family and and it's for sale it's not in great condition it's pretty it's pretty dark in there it's I, the light that you're seeing some of it is is uh, whitewash, I, but I, honestly, I think most of it's mildew. Um, but it is one of the finest frames. It is it is intact and uh, waiting for someone to buy it. I advise all my friends not to because you've got to have a lot of money to take a house like this and do it right. Um, but someone who has deep pockets and doesn't mind putting you know million dollars into restoring something to its to its original uh, nature. This house already has a good start. Again, you see that beautiful rounded fireplace with, with the chimney throat, massive, massive uh, um, girts over the fireplace. And this is what I was talking about that I saw in the Howard house, the same girt here um, with the summer beam going into it rather than it being in the masonry. This tells us that the, wood, the frame was put up and they built the masonry in between. This is a, uh, uh, this is one of the summer beams that he sanded and restored in the house. Unfortunately, he died before he finished his project and his, and his children didn't uh, have uh, the wherewithal to continue, continue on with it. This house is across from the Howard House, across the river, uh, the Reginald Foster House. Um, there's always controversy about how early this house might have been. We've settled on data. 1680 for the house, which seems about right. Built again as a half, half house on the left. And um, you take a look at the windows. You see how the windows go right up underneath the roof line. And it's very little overhang at all. And that that is very typical of uh, first period. When you get into later periods of architecture, Georgian, Federal, Greek Revival, and then Italian, uh, and all the various Victorian styles, the uh, they they would build taller rooms for one thing. And so there was more room to go up with the windows uh, uh, above the windows. And there's a you know freeze band, whereas you get in some some of them, some of the Greek revivals and, and Italian days, you would see like a 16 inch or maybe 20 inch freeze uh, over the top with uh, architraves, fine architraves. Uh, the first period houses didn't have any of that. So when you look, you say, well, look at the windows. Well, this house is, is you know, is a product of, of uh, over 300 years of, of evolution. And it actually has Italianate window hoods over it. Uh, the, the, uh, the doorway would be Greek Revival, most likely, uh, or, or possibly federal. And, um, but you know, the, the owners have had this house. They've done a wonderful job. They built the English garden. And their feeling about it is, you, is this is these architectural features are also historic features, historic architecture, and they're part of the they're part of the history of the house. Um, and they chose they chose to keep them. This is inside that house. Now the Reginald Foster house. This is your again. This is your uh, chimney girt, and and this is and you know so you got to stop here with the lamb's tongue stop. This is really, this was really quite a fine house to beat it, done the hand beating with the hand planes to do this kind of, um, this kind of work, this kind of chamfers, uh, not just a plain flat chamfer, but everything had to be done by hand. And, and you know, they probably have the young, the younger carpenters doing all this out on the workbenches and before they even put it up, then uh, everything gets pegged and your, your frame is intact. I want to show you this house that's in Tossville that I recently was in again. It's called the Parson Caton House, and it's one of the most historic houses in, in New England. It's, uh, it was built for the minister of the town in 1680. And um, uh, it was a what they would have called at that time, like many of these larger houses, a mansion house. It's got the nice overhangs. The house was restored in the early 1900s. And... You know, analysis has shown that that probably only about 15% of the house is original. But we can say that about a lot of houses that, you know, your siding gets replaced, your roofing gets replaced, um, windows get replaced, doors get replaced, inside partitions are changed. Whatever was replaced, the house is actually in the, in the form uh, that it was originally built. 
And those, and it has that overhang we're talking about. And the nice way of finishing those overhangs was was they was to do these pennant pennants. I, the pendants are not original, but they were they were it's, they were built on the added to the house when uh, when it was restored. An interesting thing about the house, though, as I mentioned to you, that the summer beams, the main the main beams, and and I'd say two thirds of the houses. Uh, in Essex County, but not true in other counties in Massachusetts. The summer beam actually extends out uh, from the back wall to the front wall, and that's what carries that overhang. Um, you can see here's the fireplace. It's a nice rounded, rounded um, masonry there. It has the hurt, but the summer beam is going in the same direction. In the other room next to it, the hall room, uh, it actually has two of these summer beams going across. Finally, we get to um, the the historic house in, in Ipswich. This is this is the Whipple House. If you've ever been to the Whipple House, you might be surprised to see what it looked like uh, in in uh, 1880. It is uh, it was in, it was it was a tenement, and uh, they, they, when they formed the Ipswich Historical Society, they looked at this house and they said, "Wow, this is this is really a house that's got to be preserved." So they they did restore it and on the grounds. It was originally located uh, close to the railroad tracks um, across from the Institution for Savings, uh, right by the mills. And um, that's where they restored it. And then uh, that side of town became uh, the working people side of town. I think there was sort of, you know, there was a little bit of snobbery here that uh, they felt like they're, they're, the Whipple House was not in the right part of town and they actually moved it. Uh, take a look at the, at the vehicles. They moved it and they pulled it with Model, model Ts. Um, I, th I think it was 1923, as I recall. And they moved the house. You can see, you can see um, this original house. The, uh, the left side was built first, the right side came later, and then the, the salt box. They did. They were not successful in lifting up the chimney. They wanted to. Uh, the chimney did not come with the house. They actually had to pick it up and literally carry this house over the choke bridge because it was wider than the bridge. This is the Whipple House today, and uh, it's at the South Green. It's owned by the uh, Ipswich Museum, and uh, they have two wonderful properties. The Herd House is is a is a uh, 1799 large federal house owned that was built by uh, Captain John Hurd. He was a privateer uh, His uh, in the revolution. His son, Augustine Hurd, carried the family tradition, uh, clips, clip trips with the China trade. Um, that they, they, so they obtained that in the 1930s. They already owned this one. So they owned both. This is their campus, the two buildings, plus the little, the little uh, house that I showed you, the reproduction house. Alexander Knight House is on the property as well. They're open um, uh, weekends, and I think uh, I think they're open Wednesday or Thursday on through Sunday, uh, and get tours on the on the hour. It's definitely worth going inside the Whipple House. Um, this is it, the end wall of the house when when they were replaced the siding, and you can see that it had that brick nogging. Um, there were other kinds of nogging, but uh, apparently, in, in it switched with it with the amount of clay that we have, that was the way it was usually done. Uh, they did, and they carried that, those brick noggings with them uh, when they carried it over the Chilok Bridge. Uh, this is an example, I, I mentioned the Saugus house with the, uh, all the little marks um, for uh, how, to put, how to put different pieces together, describe marks. This is a picture of, of Joyce in the ceiling at the Saugus house. And you can tell that the, the saw marks are vertical, but they're not completely regular. And that's from a pit saw. Uh, it's a form of uh, non-mechanized sawing where one guy's down in a pit, the other guy's standing up above, and they've got the really long saw, pull, push, pull, push. And you can imagine it gets tiring, and sometimes they take a little break, and you get irregular marks. Even though the two houses were built about the same time, uh, the Whipple House did have a power-driven saw. You can tell by the, the vertical marks are very regular. And you think, well, how can that be? It was built, the Whipple House was built right around 1670. But uh, they did have uh, primitive mechanical saws that were run by mills 
basically all you need is a cam and an arm uh, uh, that continues to move and you have a saw blade uh, that goes up and down. And that's what they used when they were building the Whipple House at the same time. Um, this is a summer beam in the Whipple House and you can see that same round, rounded beaded chamfer, nice little lamb's tongue stop, goes right into this big girt that goes over the window and that's what supports all the weight of the floors up above. At the other end, the, uh, the, the uh, um, summer beam goes into, um, into a girt in front of the fireplace like we've seen in some of these other houses. So this room is the uh, right room and it has double summer beams um, because the room may have been expanded twice uh, we're not quite sure exactly how that is. Dendrochronology has been done on the Whipple House as well. And again, they were disappointed to find not a 1645 house, it's a, about a 1670 house, according to the tree rings. This is looking at the end of the Whipple House from the street. You can see that this is the right side of the house. So this was added on. Uh, the front side does not have an overhang, but at the time this was added, 1677, the overhangs had come into vogue. So they did it on the end, but they didn't do it on the front because they wanted to, stay, to carry that same uh, facade all the way across. Then this wonderful, um, uh, perhaps at the same time, the, the overhang was added. And you can see it probably had little pendants. There is one right over there. The little shed, believe it or not, was actually on the house uh, when, it, when it was uh, at the time that it was moved back in the early 1900s. One last house I want to mention to you, uh, and then we can have uh, all the discussion that, that, that you want. Um, I'm happy to, to, to answer questions or, or learn new things from any of you. Uh, this house is at the Smithsonian. If you've ever been to the Museum of American uh, 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 History, it faces the Potomac. You go up these grand granite steps into a massive hall and then take a, a, a left down, uh, a left at the main hall and take a right when you get to the end. This, this room is there and it has this house in it. This house came from Ipswich. It was at 16 Elm Street. And the story on the house is back in the 1960s, I think it was, um, the uh, town was gonna bulldoze it down and, and, and put a transformer station there. Um, the present, we don't have a, we've never had a traditional historic district in Ipswich that's been voted down three times. We do have something now called an architectural preservation district. There, there was no bylaw that said you can't, the town or anybody else can't tear down an historic house. But two women uh, stood in front of the, the guy with the bulldozer, handed him his day, day's pay and told him to go home. They happened to have good connections uh, with, uh, with people at the Smithsonian who said, yeah, we want the house. Smithsonian came and disassembled the house, the frame, reconstructed it. And not only does this house, is it, is it done like this to show you what the outside, outer facade looked like and then how the framing looks and it shows you how the house was decorated during four or five different ownerships. Each one of these um, placards in front of the house and it goes all the way around. This is, you know, this is the house sits on this platform and you go all the way around and you learn the history of each family uh, and lived in the house. For example, Lucy and Josiah Col Caldwell lived in the house uh, before the Civil War, and they were leaders in the town of the anti-slavery movement. So they probably were involved also with the uh, with the Underground Railroad, and um, the, the anti-slavery meetings were held there in this house, which now sits at the Smithsonian. So uh, ending the show, I just want to uh, share with you my site. I have two sites. One is my newer site is called Start Massachusetts, where I, I, um, I've been doing researching history of older houses uh, throughout es Essex County. Um, and this, this is the site that I began uh, when I joined the Historical Commission about 10 years ago. Um, it has, I think, 1,200 pages now of ancestry, houses, Stark houses. I used to call it Stories from Ipswich because that's how I, my first interest was the people and you know, the, just the fascinating history of the town. Uh, sometimes it's just downright funny. Uh, the second generation after the Puritan founders, those kids, they, they really didn't like the Puritan stuff too much. They were drunk a lot. They got in a lot of trouble. They would steal things. They ended up in court. And we're really fortunate that uh, 
if in the town of Ipswich in particular, uh, it's been, you know, it, it, the history has been well recorded. I don't have to make stuff up or guess at it usually. Thomas Franklin Waters wrote two volumes set back in 1900 when he founded Ipswich Historical Society. And what I do is I put all of this online. I research, uh, I research uh, the Stark Houses. And um, so historicipswich.org, I invite you to visit my site and uh, leave comments on any page you want. So with that, I'm going to take you back to Ryan, and he has a list of questions. And we'll see what what you what we want to what we want to do next. Yeah, thanks so much, Gordon. That was wonderful. Thank you. It's amazing how many of these houses you've been into and been able to photograph. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's great access. Yeah. yeah, you wonder how many more there are hidden, you know, in Ipswich under kind of newer uh, newer decoration and and renovation. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, we claim to have 59 first period houses, and that is a very nuanced 59. Some, and like the ones I tried to show tonight, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, and some of the houses, you have to go looking for it. There's a house on High Street. It's called, it's called the White Horse Inn, and it has a sign on it that says um, uh, 1660. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, now how am I going to tell people this is a first period house? It, it looks federal, uh, if not Georgian. It's a, a big white blocky house. But the owner called me one day. He said, I just got to show you something. So he invited me up into the upstairs right uh, corner room and the one below it. It was a one over one room house with, with first period summer beans, champers, birds, the lambs, tongues, the whole works. And that little one over one room expanded just like the, the hard house did and eventually uh, received a facade on the outside that, that makes it look like it was built somewhere around 1800. Um, so it's got all those beautiful eras in it. Yeah, I'm sure you could find find that in other towns too, Marblehead and Salem. Oh, you no, know, interesting thing about Marblehead, it is just eye candy. When you go there, the colors uh, of the houses are striking. and um, uh, Ruth Strahan, the late Ruth Strahan, um, who used to be the chair of historical society uh, uh, there, commission there. And uh, I, I asked her, I said, you know, there must be a lot of first period houses. She said, no, there's not. Because uh, up to about 1700, uh, it was a really poor fisherman's town. It was founded by different people. It wasn't founded by the elite like Ipswich was. Um, uh, but the town's reverse roles. Uh, Ipswich fell into poverty because we have this lousy little town wharf. You got to you got to take a boat three miles on the river and hope you can get around Plum Island. Where Salem and Newburyport had these great ports. So after the Revolutionary War, towns like Salem, and Marblehead, and Newburyport and Boston with these wonderful ports, uh, they were the ones that that had the big shipping business. The embargo with uh, Jefferson. Jefferson's embargo in the War of 1812 pretty much put Ipswich out of business as a port as a port town. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that, that uh, we came along uh, uh, with, with a new way to make money. But the interesting thing about it is that's why Ipswich has so many old houses. They could, right. not, they could not afford to tear them down. Right. It's very much like the Cotswolds. To your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like some of those towns in England, the Cotswolds, that you know the old houses survived because they were so poor. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have we have a few uh, great questions from the uh, from the audience. So I will um, try to get to some of them. Uh, someone was actually wondering about uh, the beams and did they eventually rot? So I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about maybe how these houses have survived for so long. You know the the construction right. and the materials used. So uh, these summer beams, the beams we're talking about in the middle of the house, uh, would would be the the best protected uh, from rain. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, typically in Ipswich, the, the downstairs beam, uh, summer beam, that's the central beam that's carrying the weight of the joist, it is, is longitudinal, it goes from the fireplace to the side window, whereas upstairs it's transverse, it's tying the roof together, uh, just like we do with, with joists today, uh, and sometimes those might be exposed because of, of roof leaks. So the place that I, uh, you know, I've been doing carpentry in this town for for uh, a number of years. So, and the place where I see the most water damage is usually uh, in the sill plates. They, they, they use oak sill plates 
you know, again, beams, they're beams, and uh, they're sitting on top of rocks, uh, which protected them somewhat from water. But I've also worked on these houses uh, where I, you know, I, I've seen, you know, doorways and, and uh, surrounds that were only maybe 20 years old and they're rotting because of the poor quality farm grown finger jointed wood that we have today. And, um, and then when I take it off the, the, uh, you know, the boards behind them that date back to 16 or 1700s are, you know, they're gray, they, but they're still there and they're still intact. Right. Um, yeah, they weren't using pressure treated wood either. No, oak, oh, you know, oak. Hard, oak, oak wood, especially, you know, with the, with the uh, naturally grown trees with the, with the dense uh, rosin inside, uh, um, they, they just last so much longer than the wood we, that we use in today. Great. So let's see. Uh, so someone wanted to know where their restrictions are. There restrictions on owners to upgrade their house. I'm, I'm assuming they're wondering about Ipswich in particular, but sure. talk about any of these towns in Essex County. Um, well, Ipswich is unique. Uh, you know, Ipswich claims to be the birthplace of American independence because we had a revolt against uh, the uh, Crown-appointed Governor Andros, uh, going way back to. Uh, uh, 16 or 1689 and uh the you know the british soldiers came in arrested 10 men in ipswich and held them in the jail for for uh but they they, they got the whole town that refused to to uh to appoint a tax collector so we're the birthplace of american independence and it's interesting that as a historian i see i see a certain kind of character to this town that people in this town don't want to be told what they do uh you know, they they just they resist things that they are common sense, like replacing the fire the fire station that was built in in 1908 for horse drawn fire carriages. Uh, if you've ever drawn to, drawn uh, dr driven your car through the center of Ipswich, where Mark Street and North Main Street and South Main Street and Central Street all come together, there's two little stop signs. There's no, I mean, it's the main highway. It's it's the only one highway at 1A and 133. This town will never put a stop sign. It's just the kind of town we are. So when they tried to pass uh, a what is called a local historic district, and that's where you know things like paint colors and things like that can be uh, dictated, uh, this town has voted it down every time. So about oh geez, I guess it's been about nine years ago now. We um, we we settle on something that's more like a neighborhood conservation district. It has nothing to do with inside your house. Uh, it, it doesn't tell you what color you have to paint your house. It doesn't even tell you uh, things like your siding, your roofing, your windows, et cetera. If you own that house and you're doing some minor changes, you might make the wrong choices. So we advise, we'd like to advise people. But what, what they can't do is they can't tear down the house and they can't make uh, uh, additions or alterations that affect more than about 30% of the mass of the house without... Uh, getting approval. And what this especially does is it protects the rights of the people who live there. You buy a house that was built saved in the 1700s and you're and you're surrounded by houses built during you know those early years. You know what your neighborhood is like. And you don't want somebody that's got a lot of money, a developer to come in and tear down um, tear down a house that's historic so you can put some ugly condo there, pop it right down in the middle of your historic neighborhood. People understand that. They understand that that kind of preservation is designed to protect them, protect their investment, protect the community they live in. It's not designed to dictate to them how they live in their houses. Seems like it works well for Ipswich. So. Yeah. I mean, we, we made it 300 years without even that. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, the town loves its history. It's really amazing. I came here only... Uh, 2000. I moved here in 2004, and I, I'd been here coming for a few years before that. I said, "This is the place I want to live." I've never seen a place that just really loves its history as much. Oh yeah, <clears throat> we've actually had this question from a couple people. Um, so they're wondering how many people would have worked on building one of these houses. So would it take the village? Yeah. And that's a great question. And, and how long would it take? Sorry, how long would it take? Okay. Also, that's the second part, you know, to, to construct one of these. So, well, so the the first thing uh, is you got to is is the house itself. Everything the be the frame is the most important part here. 
and and that whole frame has to be cut out in advance. Uh, there was a problem. So the, uh, first of all, getting the trees. Trees were, believe it or not, there's more trees in New England now than there were when the settlers got here. The Native Americans had burned off a lot of uh, for thousands of years, I guess, uh, for their cornfields, etc. Um, I mean that's speculative, but I've read that. Uh, certainly, there's uh, you look at the the uh, hillsides. Uh, in the early photographs, and there's no trees on all these hillsides here, all the way up in the Vermont. And so getting the lumber is the first thing. It was often shipped down, down the rivers from up in New Hampshire or Maine. And um, that's the first part of the process. And then the timbers had to be hewn, um, shaped, all the joints put together. Everything's laid out by uh, really engineers, colonial engineers. Okay, this is all going to fit, guys. We got it. And, and uh, and it's all going to go together with these little pegs, you know. But uh, the uh, you know young carpenter might they might put in the work uh, of planing beads. And mind you, the town only even in you know by 1700 it only had a couple thousand residents. So it's a good question because who's doing the work? I'm thinking that these basically upper middle class um, Puritans who came here as as partly for religious reasons, but for also before monetary reasons. They're not doing the work. My theory recently, and I, I, this is my next area of research, is they were, they were indenturing a lot of Scottish and Irish uh, prisoners of war during Cromwell's war. And they would come here and they had to work for seven years or so, and then they could be, give, be given their freedom. I'm suspecting a lot of them were, were, bring, were the ones who were doing the, all the hard work. Uh, it would certainly take a big crowd. If you've ever seen a barn raising, Amish barn raising, or I've got some pictures of barn raisings being done in Canada. It, it, there's a gang of men. There's a lot of people. Um, it's a big event. The, the wives come out with, with, the, um, you know, with, with picnics of food to keep everybody you know, nourished and, and um, hydrated. It's a, it's a town event. So I think your questioners got the right, the right idea. Great. Um, another question. Uh, what was the purpose of the lamb's tongue? Um, and maybe you could talk more about like the decoration of the framing inside. Right. And, and you know, it's that frame is what really stands out to me is, is distinctively of what makes the house first period. Uh, and the, so there's a chamfer on the bottom of the beam. Um, and for no other reason, it, uh, so that when you, if you hit your head on it, <laughs> that you're not going to get hurt. Uh, and, and the uh, chamfer got more ornate in the, in the more expensive houses. But you have a mortise at the end where that beam goes in uh, to, to uh, another beam or, or girt. Um, uh, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a mortise and tenon. Uh, but you've got, you've got a, this angle, angle or this, you know, this uh, beaded. You've got to stop that before you get to the place where the square hole is. So that uh, that stop, the lamb's tongue stop, uh, it developed early. I think we even saw that, you know, in the Fairbanks house. Um, it was just a little nice way to finish it out, and it, it's just how people did it. Some of the poorer houses did not have that. Speaking of uh, framing, the second floor overhang. What's your understanding of the purpose of that? Yeah. So um, again. Most of the most, if not all of the overhangs that we have today that we're looking at indicate the house is not the oldest house in the town. It's one of the oldest uh, because it was a post medieval re revival that was going on uh, from about 1680, say, to 1710, more in the, in late 1700s, uh, late 1600s. And in my mind, I see that as almost a, as as a reaction to the push towards you know Georgianization. You know, is like, come on, it's just the way we built houses. Let's 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 show how people how houses were really built. Um, where you know in England the Georgian style was already taking off, uh, but by about 1720, uh, here in the New England, uh, plastered walls covering up all of that all that woodwork, uh, all those beams that came into vogue. And I forgot what your question actually was. <laughs> um, what's kind of your understanding of the, the purpose of the overhang? The overhang. So that was that that in that particular era, it was it was a post-medieval revival. 
So my friend John Fisk, who un unfortunately died recently, uh, was a collected me medieval furniture and, and it was sold in a great antiques magazine. He was chair of the Starkel Commission for a long time. Um, uh, he wrote a book called "When When Oak Was Oak Was New," and what it was is that you look at the furniture or or the um, or the houses. They were all joined. They weren't called carpenters. They were joiners. Uh, so uh, what happened was in medieval England, people were living in little houses like that um, that little uh, recreation house I showed you, and they didn't have chimneys. Uh, they, you know, you could think of a, of a medieval uh, peasant's house in England as a wood teepee, uh, fire inside, sometimes right, no floor, and something, some genius uh, said, you know, I could take these bricks and I could make this thing, we'll call it a chimney, we can have the fire and have the smoke go out. As soon as chimneys came, it began to be built, they realized they could heat the house a lot more and they could use that upper area, which is so smoke filled, previous buildings. So when they when they wanted to add a second floor now, uh, if you look at the, a lot of these towns had little cart paths, cartways in between these peasants' houses. They couldn't build a house any any further into the road, but they could add a second floor, overhang it over the road. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is that if you've got a, a single level, single floor house, you post your post and beam, and you can take off the roof, for example, and you want a second floor. If you've got a post, you don't want to stick the other post on top of it. What you what they would do is is run run the second floor uh, uh, beams across and tenon this, and then tenon that uh, overhanging post in, into that one, uh, and it gives you a lot more strength in trying to do everything. Then when you get to the top, is it true with all the all of those early houses? You the the post becomes a gun stock. It flares out. And it's catching the rafter and this beam and a, a girt that goes across on, on the end. So a lot of a lot of joinery. Uh, so basically it's about the joinery. What's what makes it strong? Yeah. You also wonder because <clears throat> the overhang isn't always at the front of the house. I've seen early uh, you know, not photos, but um images of what the Gedney house in Salem looked like originally in the the overhang was actually on the side facing High Street, facing yeah. the main like road. Whipple House. Yeah, the Whipple House too. Um, yeah. The House of Seven Gables, you know, the overhang was on the front, but facing the, the harbor. So yeah. I wonder if it was, you know, something decorative too. That, that's, that was Cummings uh, opinion. He said uh, that it was, that it was a post-medieval revival. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, also, Cummings wrote, and this is something that I that I may get a chance to actually see uh, in a house here in Ipswich soon. He said that when the Georgian era came and this post medieval style, uh, as many fascists do, went out of vogue, that people uh, he said took them off. Now I don't know how exactly how they did that, uh, how they took those off, and how they did it, how they managed to to uh, uh, connect it with the roof line. Did they, did they extend the bottom so the whole front of the house was, was flat? I don't know, but there's the, the original Foster house, that beautiful red house on Water Street that I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, I was talking with the owner um, by email and she asked me to come over and look in the basement. She said that uh, um, when it was surveyed by Cummings that he said there's evidence that it once had an overhang. So I gotta see how they did it and how they took it off. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. <clears throat> We're getting uh, a little bit past 8.30. Um, so thanks so much, Gordon. Um, yeah, just want to let everyone know that we were hosting a couple walking tours with, with you uh, in Ipswich, focused on primarily on first period architecture in Ipswich. Um, it looks like the two tours we have are, are close to sold out. So I, I figured they'd be very popular. Um, so maybe we can add a couple more uh, this yeah. fall. We'll talk about that. But um, everyone that's here, you know, check Essex Heritage's website um, for information about those tours and if we add, do add more. Um, and keep an eye out for the other programs in this series. So the next one will be uh, September 14th. So keep an eye out for that. Excellent. I'll be looking forward to that. And I see a lot of thank yous popping up in the chat. So thank you guys too for coming. This was really nice to to get to uh, share all my insights and experiences with so many people tonight.
yeah, thank you all for, for coming. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thanks.